A lot of people knew about sea dragons, or at least they knew they exist. But that knowledge is most of the time incomplete and may raise misconception because it's usually based on one species only. So I thought, why do not talk about them as a group to make it holistic? So, let me broad up the question. What exactly is sea dragon? Sea dragons are fish in the Sinantidae family, together with the pipe fishes and seahorses. At a glance, you might think they are the closest relative to the seahorses. Some might even guess they evolved from seahorses, but they are not. They actually formed their own branch in the phylogenetic tree. I'll talk about the differences in the next section. There are actually three different species of sea dragons. The most famous one is the leafy sea dragons, Ficodurus equus. Ficodurus means seaweed tail. Equus is either literally horseman or some modification of equus, which means horse. The name itself is self-explanatory. This one was found in 1865. The first sea dragon to be found and described was the common sea dragon, also known as weedy. Philopteryx means leaf wing, while tineolatus means tape or ribbon. Fast forward to this century, a new species was found and described in 2015. Well, not exactly. It was thought to be a specimen of the weedy in Western Australian Museum. After analyzing the DNA sequence and comparing the skeletal morphology, it was found out to be a different species, closely related to the weedy. Since the leaf color is ruby red, it's called the ruby sea dragon, in the same genus as the weedy. Dewey Sea is a tribute for Mary Dewey Lowy, for her love of the sea and support for sea dragons conservation. All of these sea dragons are native to the Australian coast and some distances from it, usually at around 10 meter to 30 meter depths, but the ruby sea dragons live in deeper water offshore. Sea dragons and seahorses differ from the pipefishes by having archy back posture. They also don't have true caudal fins. Seahorses differs from the rest by having a vertical swimming posture and head that orient towards their belly, which are their forward. They propel forward with their dorsal fin. Pipe fishes propel with their caudal fin, while the sea dragons are… well, I'll talk about this in the next section. Seahorses are also known for their prehensile tail, but some pipe fishes also do. Ruby sea dragons also have prehensile tail, but since the others don't, they probably evolve prehensile tail later. Sea dragons have a tubular fish jaw, that is the character of the order. Sindantiformes, literally in the name. They also don't have teeth, which is a character shared with all members of the Sindantidae family. They only have dorsal fin and really small pectoral fins, which is also a character shared in this family. Oh, I've mentioned that they have archy back posture, but even compared to the seahorses, their back is extremely archy. Adult sea dragons are usually around 20 to 25 centimeters, which are bigger than most seahorses, but still smaller than the largest seahorse. Apparently, the weedy can even reach 45 centimeters, and if it's true, then they are indeed bigger than the seahorses. The leafies and weedy are very colorful, while the ruby is just red with vertical lighter stripes. The colors of the leafies and weedy can vary based on their diets and locations. But in general, leafy have tan yellow color with pink and white vertical bars, while the weedy have purple brown color with yellow spots on the sides and purple vertical bars. The sea dragons are popularly identified to have leafy appendages. That's why other species are usually also called sea dragon by the public, for example, the Haliichthys, which are also known as the ribbon sea dragon, but they are not sea dragon. They are pipefish. Their posture is relatively straight and their juveniles have caudal fins that dissipate towards adulthood. Some would even categorize them in the fourth general group, the pipe horses. Anyway, not even all the sea dragons have leafy appendages. The ruby sea dragons do not have those. They still have the spines that support these though. The more we talk about them, the more the ruby sea dragon seems like an outlier. But if we compare the skeletons, 
we could actually see that they are actually very similar to the VD. So the classification makes a lot more sense. As you can see here, the leafies have more spines that are also longer, which is why, on the outside, they have more of these leafy appendages, which are also bigger. They are probably the most famous among the sea dragons because of their look. Most people think of the leafies when the topic of sea dragon is brought up. Oh, by the way, just like the seahorses, they don't have scales. Instead, they have bony plates covering their body. The leaves themselves are actually just skins, so it's not hard or something like that. They also don't have the muscles necessary to move these leafy appendages, so it's not fins. They're just hanging there. They do have functions, of course, which most people either have already known or can easily guess, but I'll talk about it anyway. But before that, The leaf-like appendages are there for camouflage. It resembles the seagrass or seaweed in their habitat. Because those are skins, it could also sway along with the current, just like a seagrass or seaweed. Meanwhile, the ruby sea dragon might look weird in our eyes. Why don't they have leaf appendages? And why are they red? What happened to camouflage? Well, we can say that because we see their color in shallow water, some even taken back to the land. They live in deeper water, where it is relatively sparse, so leaf-like appendages wouldn't make sense for a camouflage. Their color is also very cryptic in this depth with low light. Just look at this. They don't look red in this photograph. They even blend quite well with the background, right? Oh, and remember I said that the ruby sea dragons have prehensile tail? This might also be because they live in sparse habitat. If a strong surge comes, they will be swept far away because there is not much things that will stop the search. That's why a prehensile tail might be useful to help them grasp on things and mitigate the search. I've briefly mentioned about them swimming before, so let's talk about it. The sea dragons don't do lateral undulating like most fishes when swimming. Instead, it looks like they're just floating, drifting, following the current. That is to some extent correct, but they actually can actively swim. Look closer. See this? They propel with their small pectoral fins. Not only they don't have the proper fins for proper locomotion, there is also a problem that limits their mobility. Can you guess what it is? It's these leaf appendages. Those are fragile and make their body not so hydrodynamic. Basically, those add a lot of drags, which is probably why the ruby sea dragons either lost this character or didn't develop it, because it'll just be a nuisance for them. You might have heard that they don't have stomach, but it depends on what you define as stomach. In a broad sense, they technically have a stomach, but their stomach is very simple and significantly less functional than the usual stomach in vertebrates. Besides that, their mouth is very narrow, which is why they need to eat frequently in small amount each. When feeding, they swim towards the prey and do this snappy strike. Right there. One last thing. You might have heard about seahorses' male pregnancy, but what about sea dragons? Well, first of all, it's not male pregnancy. The male just carries the eggs until it hatch. They do develop some kind of pseudoplacenta though, so it does resemble pregnancy a little bit. Anyway, this male brooding is a character for the family, so it includes pie fishes and of course sea dragons. The difference is, while the seahorses have an actual enclosed brood pouch to store these eggs, the sea dragons do not. Male sea dragons carry the eggs on the underside of their tail. These have invaginated membranous compartments to hold the eggs. So basically, to illustrate, it's like this. This is the underside of the tail. These are the eggs, and these are the compartments. The spawns are precautional, so they basically can take care of themselves after they hatch. They will reach sexual maturity at around two years or a couple months after. The IUCN red list categorized them as least concern, but habitat loss is potentially a major threat for them. Some argue that they should be classified as endangered. The Australian government prohibits the capture and export of sea dragons. 
There is a dedicated project called the Sea Dragon Search to monitor the population. Basically, people can submit photographs of their sightings as data. It's a citizen science project. There are even leaderboards for competitive person or just for fun. It's also supported by various organizations. They also publish infographics for everyone to see. You can check them out in their website or their social media. And that's about it. Did you learn anything new? Sea dragons are my favorite fish, so even if there are many videos about them already, I just want to make this video for, well, myself I guess. I've learned some new things about them while making this video. If you learned something new, then good for us. Anyway, for now, let's just learn what is known. And that's all for now. Oh, by the way, did you know that sea dragons are one of the most expensive fish to keep? That's why only few aquariums in the world have them. So you're somewhat lucky if you live near one. Anyway, enjoy your day.